Good morning from a frigid South Bend, Indiana. I'm Kevin Brennan with the Notre Dame Alumni Association. Thanks so much for joining us once again for another edition of Catching Up With, the online learning series where we let you hear directly from and learn a little bit more about some of our most interesting Notre Dame alumni. Our guest today is Robert Costa. Robert is a 2008 graduate of Notre Dame and a national political reporter at the Washington Post and a must read for any political junkie looking forward to the 2016 presidential election. Robert, thanks so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Definitely. Um, so we, we want to get to uh, your, uh, your career as a political journalist in Washington and talk a little 2016, but on Catching Up With, we always kind of like to start at the beginning. So where did you grow up? I grew up in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, which is a suburb north of Philadelphia. Went to a public high school, Pennsbury High School. Uh, did a lot of journalism, was an editor of my school newspaper, uh, worked on the school TV station, covered Philadelphia Eagles games, covered rock concerts for the local paper. Had a lot of fun in high school, and then came to Notre Dame and, and did a lot of the same there. Well, I hope you're not an Eagles fan as a, as a New York Giants fan. but uh, <laughs> I'm an Irish fan. All right, all right, there we go. That's something we can agree on. Um, so were you, from a very young age, were you interested in politics? I really was. I, my parents... Uh, are not involved in politics. They're both graduates of the University of Notre Dame Law School, uh, but they love history. And we, I, my dad has a great collection of books, nonfiction, collects a lot of first edition signed books. And I really got interested in the presidents and Senate history and political campaigns when I was young. And uh, I just decided to pursue it uh, more formally later after college. But really, in my teenage years and my college years, I was a political junkie. I was a reading the blogs, I was following the campaigns, I was interested in the strategists, I, I love books about the the, camp, the presidential campaigns, everything from Bob Shrum's book about John Kerry to Teddy White's famous books about the presidency, game change, that kind of thing. And I, I think the internships at Notre Dame are really important. I worked for Charlie Rose show on PBS and the ha Mark, for Mark Halpern at ABC News writing the note. And it, it was kind of fun to transition from being a political junkie to a political junkie who does it as a job. Yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned that your uh, your parents both went to Notre Dame Law School. Did you did you grow up a Notre Dame fan? Is that kind of why you decided to go to Notre Dame when it came time for college? It was a huge part of why I decided to go to Notre Dame. Both my parents went to law school there. My mom is the class of 1979, and my dad is the class of 1980. Uh, they had met in Washington, D.C. They both love politics, and they decided to go to N.D. for law school. But my uh, family has a long history at Notre Dame. My grandfather went there class of 1949. My mother's mother went to St. Mary's. I have a lot of aunts who went to St. Mary's and uncles, uh, an uncle who went to Notre Dame in the 1980s, and some great-grandparents as well. So a rich history. I'm really proud to be part of Notre Dame, it, it, not only as a student and alum, but as a, someone who, who has a family that's had a, an association with it for a long, long time. And when you were on campus, you know, you mentioned that when you were in college you had some great internships. Uh, what, what did you do when you were on campus as a student that helped prepare you for your career as a political reporter? Uh, one of the great things about Notre Dame is the people you get to meet. And South Bend may not seem like a journalism hotbed, but Professor uh, Bob Schmuel in the American Studies Department, he was really, and still is, uh, a mentor to me. He uh, helped open the door for internships, give guidance on career. And I think Notre Dame... Uh, doesn't get enough attention for really having some great professors like Smule, uh, Matt Storen, the former Boston Globe editor who, who is long be who's been on campus for a long time. Uh, and there's a culture with the Scholastic Magazine, the Observer, NDTV, that really encourages young journalists. And I found uh, it to be a place that was welcoming and encouraging at the same time. Uh, so as you neared kind of the end of your academic career at Notre Dame, your senior year, when you were finishing up, did you know what you wanted to do? Was it kind of political reporting? Were you, were you focused on that? I was thinking about maybe doing a lot of things. Music journalism I always loved. Maybe I did an internship at J.P. Morgan when I was in college, thought maybe about business. But really I settled on journalism after I worked at ABC News, after I worked for the Charlie Rose Show at, as an undergrad. And NDTV was a great experience for me. Hosting a show there called Office Hours, got to interview Father Jenkins many times, and brought some rock stars like Tim Reynolds from the Dave Matthews Band to campus to do interviews. So I, I just had a, I got a kick out of it, and uh, I got a, a really interesting opportunity after graduation 
to be a fellow at the Wall Street Journal uh, at the editorial page, and I was a reporter for the editorial page. So I got to cover concerts for them. Uh, Irma Thomas, the, the singer, uh, the, the band Fish, who, who I'm a fan of. Also got to write a review about them. And, and, and Bobby Jindal, the governor of Louisiana, did a profile of him for the Wall Street Journal. So I did that fellowship right after graduating in 08 for about three or four months. And then I went to the University of Cambridge and got a master's degree in politics, studying Winston Churchill and British politics. And how does that, you know, a background in history of politics and British politics, how does that inform your reporting? How does that uh, help you in your day-to-day -day job now? It really actually still informs me in this sense, is that when I was over in England, I got an opportunity to intern for a member of parliament named Andrew Lansley, who went on to serve in the Tory government uh, recently for David Cameron, the Prime Minister, as the Secretary of Health. But while working for Lansley, he was in the minority. Uh, he was on the shadow cabinet, as they say. And I got the opportunity to see politics up close. I love the, the joy, the arguing, the fight that's in British politics. I got to see that politics can be an active sport. It's really serious with public policy. Uh, but the players and the personalities and the egos, especially inside of the House of Commons, it was captivating to watch. I used to go up to the, the second and third level of the spectator section of the House of Commons and just watch them go at each other day after day. And I thought, hey, I may not cover British politics for a living, but covering these guys, what drives politicians, what what power is about, and figuring that out, that really uh, was something that intrigued me, and it still does. Um, and, and then so you really rose to kind of prominence uh, – in your career in D.C. as a political reporter at your previous job at the National Review. Uh, how did you go from, you know, your graduate studies in, in England to ending up at the National Review as a political reporter? Well, I was sitting over in England at grad school finishing up my master's thesis on Churchill, and I was thinking, what am I going to do? Uh, and I wanted to do journalism, and there was an opportunity at National Review, a great opportunity to be the William F. Buckley Fellow in journalism. and. Bill Buckley, the founder of National Review, had died in 2008. His family and the, the magazine had set up this fellowship to encourage young journalists. And I was the first Buckley Fellow. And it was a great, great chance to really step into journalism, to learn from some uh, magazine editors and writers who have been doing the, the, the craft for a long time. And I, I covered politics from day one. I never, I never wanted to be an editorial writer. I wasn't interested in writing a column. I thought as a 23, 24-year-old starting out, no one really cared about my opinion, but they did. They were interested if I had something to bring to the table in terms of reporting. I was more comfortable. I always have been as a reporter, not having to weigh in with an opinion or an aside, but really just sharing information, collecting information. And I like that give and take, the chase of doing an interview, making calls, finding sources. And I got to develop that over about 40, four and a half, five years at National Review. It seems like that's sort of a, somewhat of a... a lost calling or a calling that's diminishing when you look at sort of the media landscape. It seems like things have gone a lot more in the direction of people um, kind of putting forth their opinions is, you know, what was it that made you want to go that route rather than, you know, especially at a place like National Review where, you know, editorializing is, is really part of what they do. Why did you decide to stick to straight reporting and really be kind of an, an old school reporter? Well, I mean, as I said, it is partially a natural fit. But I think also it's a smart, to be frank, a smart career move because it's very easy to burn out as a pundit. You, you say one controversial thing, you become pegged as a certain point of view or has, as having a certain point of view. It, it's not the greatest career path to be someone who's known as a, a bomb thrower or someone who's incendiary or someone who, who has a, a lot of opinions. And I, to me, it's much more fun to be on a campaign trail or in the halls of Congress figuring out what's happening and hearing the inside scoop, meeting the players, and, and to do that, you can't be someone who constantly thinks of yourself as a player. And One of the most important things I always remind myself as a reporter is that as much as it's great to be on the front page or it's great to have, uh, to have some fun on Twitter or to go on TV, uh, the most important thing to realize is you're not the story. As a reporter, you're telling the story, you try to capture the story, and, and you're in the background, and you're and you got to listen to what's happening, you got to see it, smell it, try to capture it as best as possible, and, and share it. Uh, and for those that have followed your career, I think the best example of kind of that uh, mentality was probably during the government shutdown of, of 2013, where you really became 
uh, widely recognized in, in the political press and in D.C. as sort of the go-to person um, for following what was going on, especially among Republicans in Congress, what they were thinking uh, during, during the government shutdown. What was it that allowed you to break so many stories during uh, that kind of ongoing saga? Well, on a personal level, I had been covering the conservative movement and the Republican Party deeply in Congress, and especially that right flank that always ca causes problems for Speaker Boehner. For about three, four years down in Washington, uh, by the time the shutdown came around in late 2013, and it was really a beat. I, and I looked at my job at National Review; it was almost like working for a trade journal. If you're working for Car and Driver magazine, no, not everyone reads Car and Driver magazine every day. But when the cars are the biggest story in America, some people may pick it up more. And I was covering Republicans day in, day out, all the different. Uh, twists and turns and the political dynamics within the House GOP. And then when the House GOP suddenly becomes the biggest story in America, I did what I like doing, which is when something big happens, you live there. So I almost lived at the Capitol uh, in the press gallery, I, I, and I really developed lawmakers as sources. I think it's so important to talk to people who are actually making decisions, as well as their advisors, but you don't want to just talk to advisors. And that was kind of my, my style, my M.O., for going after the shutdown. Talk to lawmakers, talk to aides, corroborate stories, and just be there because things were happening behind the scenes that you almost have to see it happen because people, unless you spotted the meeting yourself, uh, you may never knew what occurred. And one of the interesting things about that time is while we talked earlier about kind of you really have an old school reporter approach to your job, you also were breaking a ton of news and interesting tidbits uh, via Twitter, via social media. How do you as kind of a uh, reporter in this day and age, how do you use social media to supplement your reporting? I think a lot of people say, oh, it's tough to be a journalist today because the newspapers are having trouble and, and some magazines are having some issues. But I, I disagree. I think this is one of the greatest times to be a journalist because of social media, and that's a big part of it, because instead of just writing one story a day, you can write a story all day, and you can write a story for the paper, but also share the whole scene with the political junkies like yourself who are on Twitter and are on other uh, social media platforms. And, and, and to me, Twitter is the modern version of a notebook. And, and a reporter's notebook is a sacred thing. You put something in a notebook, it means you're going to use it in a story. It also means you've checked it out, it's accurate, you've seen it or you heard it yourself, and, it, and it's your whole uh, basis of, of reporting. And, and, and you use that notebook to eventually write. For me, Twitter is the notebook now. If I know something, I see it, and I find it interesting, and I think my, my readers would or other political junkies would, I share it. Why not? And, and I think that inclination to share is really what makes this younger generation, my generation of millennial journalists, a little different. We, we like to share, if it's accurate, and, and all that, of course, uh, that's the, the priority. Uh, but to not be afraid to say, here's how Boehner made an aside in the hallway, or here's how Mitt Romney uh, had, his, had his burrito made at Chipotle. It sounds sometimes like small ball stuff and fluffy, and, it, and sometimes it is. But sometimes it, as you build a story through small details, it helps people and yourself learn more about the subject. And so after all your success at, uh, at National Review, you end up uh, getting hired by the Washington Post, and uh, obviously kind of the top of the mountain uh, for political reporting in the United States and a you know, really historic uh, platform you have there as a national political reporter. For someone who grew up loving politics and, and, uh, and following it so closely, what did it feel like to, at such a young age, kind of sit back and look and say, wow, I'm a political reporter at the Washington Post? It is kind of surreal. You walk in the, the fifth floor newsroom here, which is right behind me, and you see the Pulitzer Prizes. You see... Bob Woodward's office. You see Dan Balls, my colleague, the great, uh, great colleague, and a long, uh, re respected political journalist, uh, walking through the halls, giving advice, and, and you see the team here of people who are so embedded in national politics and covering it for years and years, and that you just keep learning and learning, and and the history is a rich one, and and you always remember it uh, as you go about the day and you go to the stories and you report because you realize. Just like at Notre Dame is a great institution, so is the Washington Post, and you, and you respect where you come from and, and what you stand for. And uh, and I think it, it helps with reporting as well because people respect the Washington Post. Uh, they expect its mission, which is to be accurate, to be right, and, and to be smart. And uh, I'm just I, I'm honored to be here. Uh, sometimes you can feel like a, a little bit of a guest because it's such a, a heady experience, but it, it's cool. It's cool to be part of the team.
Uh, and do you have a specific beat uh, at the post now? Uh, national politics, and that entails uh, campaigns, mostly presidential campaigns, Senate campaigns, some gubernatorial campaigns, and Congress. So when Congress is hot, uh, like it was on immigration a few months ago, or with a, a spending fight, I'll go to Capitol Hill and I'll help out our congressional team. Uh, but mostly right now I'm focusing on 2016. Uh, but I really like balancing between uh, the campaigns and Congress because I, I really believe uh, that you can't really understand both fully unless you sometimes appear uh, on both beats because they really are intertwined. They feature some of the same players. That's really interesting. Uh, you, you mentioned that you're doing a lot of 2016 uh, coverage right now, um, and let's let's talk about that for a little bit. I'm sure uh, while we have you here, our uh, audience of alumni, parents, and friends would love to get your perspective on, on the uh, kind of early machinations of the race here. On the Democratic side, it seems like all the talk is about Hillary Clinton. Uh, does it seem like she's definitely running? And, and, and if so, is there anyone who might run in the Democratic primary who could, who could give her a run for her money? Well, I think Secretary Clinton is certainly all but certain to run for president. Uh, she's already hiring staff behind the scenes. She's looking for office space in New York. And I think she's seen as the presumptive frontrunner for the Democratic nomination. But that doesn't mean other Democrats aren't going to run. Bernie Sanders, the independent senator, socialist, self-proclaimed socialist from Vermont. I've been with him in Iowa in the last few weeks. He'll be in Iowa again this weekend. Uh, you see Jim Webb, the former Virginia senator. He's an anti-war Democrat. He work, but he still works in the Reagan administration, so he's a little more uh, conservative on some other issues. He's thinking about running. Martin O'Malley, the ex-governor of uh, Maryland, he's thinking about running. It's going to be tough for Sanders, O'Malley, and Webb to get fundraising. Uh, Clinton is really f outpacing everyone on that front. Uh, the most interesting person to watch is Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts. She is not running at the moment, but there is a draft effort out there in Iowa and New Hampshire and elsewhere to get her in the race. And if the Democratic Party really is being pulled by progressives to the left and they want to see someone who's in that spirit as the nominee, I think the pressure is only going to mount for Senator Warren to jump in the race. Well, that would be, uh, that would be fascinating. On, on the Republican side, which uh, obviously you you know traditionally covered more closely at the your previous position, so you have a ton of uh, experience there. What um, there's a number of potential candidates lining up, but it seems like right now Jeb Bush is kind of getting the most attention. Is, is he sort of the favorite for the Republican nomination at this point, or is it too early to call anyone that? I think it's too early. Uh, John McCain in 2008, his campaign was was called dead at one point because he wasn't raising a lot of money and he was stumbling with his infrastructure that he ended up winning the nomination. We saw Rick Santorum at this point in the 2012 cycle getting zero attention, had no money, and then he ended up winning 11 states and coming second in the race against Mitt Romney for the nomination. So it is far too early, but I think Bush is getting ahead on fundraising. He's going to have a big quarter. He's asking some of his major donors to give $100,000 or more to his new PAC. Uh, and, and Bush, I think, He's trying to prove that he could be the front runner, and I think one of the reasons he's out there so early fundraising so much is that he hasn't been on a ballot since 2002. He served as governor from 1 in 98, 1 again in 2002, but he's really been in a period of political winter ever since, running an education foundation, doing some private sector work. And so for him to step back into the political scene, he needs to signal to the big donors in Washington and around the country that he's for real. That's why he's giving all these speeches. He was in Chicago on Wednesday talking about foreign policy. But it's difficult for Bush. As much as he's a favorite of the establishment, uh, he's not really the favorite of the grassroots. And I think his speaking style, it's, it's pretty rushed. Uh, his presentation, I think, is going to perhaps need a little work. And his allies have acknowledged this in private interviews with me. And so we'll have to see how he unfolds as a candidate. And then you got Christie, the governor of New Jersey. He's struggling right now, but he could come back, has a national network uh, of donors behind him. I think Scott Walker, beyond Bush, is someone to watch, the Wisconsin governor. He's really getting out there and being a, a someone who is a darling of conservatives for how he went after the public employee unions in Wisconsin. They see him as someone who won three elections in four years in the Badger State. And so he's someone who's certainly on the radar of a lot of people on the right and the center right of the GOP. Uh, it seems like two other names that are coming up a lot um, on kind of in, from the more conservative wing of the party are Ted Cruz and Rand Paul. Does it seem like uh, they're both lining up for runs, and, and how would you kind of handicap uh, their chances? 
Well, I was just in Iowa with Senator Paul, and, he, and he's really interesting because he's bridging uh, a lot of different blocks within the Republican Party. He has his father in his father's libertarian wing. Uh, they, they did pretty well in 2012. Uh, they were able to uh, come close in New Hampshire, come pretty close in Iowa. And Paul is really trying to get that base revived. When he was in Iowa, he was talking a lot about the Federal Reserve, which is his father's key issue, auditing the Federal Reserve. And so he's going after his father's base. At the same time, he's trying to reach out more to minority communities. He's, he's spoken at a lot of historically black colleges. And, and his pitch is, I can be my father on fiscal issues, on spending. I'm a libertarian. But on foreign policy, I'm a non-interventionist. I, I have reservations about fighting all of these wars. And he thinks he can connect with some of those Republicans who are weary still by the Bush years and are looking for a different pitch on foreign policy. And he's, he's saying if Secretary Clinton is the Democratic nominee, Republicans are going to do have, have to do something to expand the electorate. And he thinks his unique political persona gives Republicans the opportunity to offer an alternative that's not just the, in the traditional Romney-Bush mold. And, uh, and if... It, it seems like after the last two presidential elections, both wins for President Obama, obviously, there was a lot of talk about how Democrats really have kind of taken control of in national elections. The map and, and, and change in demographics across the country really favors Democrats in presidential elections. How much of a, if, if let's say it's Secretary Clinton against uh, one of the Republicans we mentioned, how much of a challenge is it for uh, Republicans because of that to win at the presidential level now or do things really change after eight years of President Obama in the White House? Well, there is an argument to made that after two hundred, uh, after two campaigns for the president, uh, Republic, uh, voters may be looking for a Republican for someone else to come in. Uh, but it's going to be—you have to get to two hundred seventy electoral votes, and the path there is difficult because de Democrats come into almost any race for the presidency. They got California in there. They got New York. Uh, Florida is going to be—if if Bush was the nominee, we'll see. But Florida has been pretty good for the Democrats in recent years. And so we'll have to see how can Republicans expand the map. And that's why I think this primary is going to be fascinating to watch on the Republican side because you have Bush, Rand Paul to an extent. They're saying we're not going to run to the right to win a primary because we have to pay attention to those centrist and moderate voters we need in a general election. There's a, there's a, a consensus in a lot of Republican circles that Romney, Santorum, they were all pushed so far to the right in 2012 they, they almost crippled themselves coming into the general election against the president and they really weren't able, able to have a compelling argument to those skeptical voters in the center and so how do republicans you know make sure they win florida make sure they win a colorado a wisconsin is it someone like walker who's going after the unions who has a, a more blue collar background is it someone like bush who has, has a well-known name and a more moderate tone uh, these are questions Republicans are going to have to answer in the coming months, and, and I think it's going to be a real open and, f and fired-up debate because there's a lot of competing opinions in the GOP. Well, it seems like it's going to be a fascinating race to follow, and uh, definitely will be a lot of fun following your reporting over the next uh, year and a half or so. Uh, looking back at Notre Dame a little bit, last year you were uh, you know, named to the uh, Board of Trustees here at the university. What has that experience been like for you, being part of the leadership of, of the university? It's been a learning experience and an honor uh, to be part of the discussions. You really learn about how Notre Dame is not just a community of scholars and students, but it's a business, and it, it has a global presence, and it has a brand, and all these things need to be grown, and they need to be protected, and, and it, it, there are so many people who have a connection to Notre Dame who want to see it do well, who want to protect it, and I really appreciate the opportunity to get to know a lot of those fellow trustees and to just have a chance to sit down and, and think about Notre Dame and see, see how best could the university move forward. And I really respect Father Jenkins as a leader. He's done an excellent job, just elected to another five-year term. And I, I think his, his humble approach, his ability to bring people together on the board and elsewhere, it's really, I think Notre Dame is going to have an aggressive ambitious next decade. We're going to see it become a better research university. You're going to see more kinds of students want to come here without ever losing that Catholic identity. And I, I, the board, as much as I, I love Notre Dame when I was on campus, it just has given me uh, an insight into how big Notre Dame is and how complicated it can be. Sure, and you mentioned earlier uh, 
that you're a huge uh, Irish football fan. What you know, looking forward to next season. You have any uh, any predictions on record or anything like that? I thought at Notre Dame we always aim for the national title. <laughs> so that's where I'm, that's where, that's my motto right now. There Why not? Go. I think Brian Kelly. He's still coming into his own as a coach. I wish him all the best. There you go. Well, we like to hear that. Well, Robert, uh, we know you're a, we're a busy man. We uh, appreciate you coming on today. Thanks so much for uh, for joining us, for uh, letting us learn a little bit more about you and your kind of journey to where you are now and, and talking a little politics with us. We really enjoyed it. Nah, happy to do it. Thanks so much. Thanks to all of you who watch live or who are watching later on My Notre Dame or on our YouTube page. Uh, remember, you can, for future editions of Catching Up With and all of our online learning programs and to watch all of our previous shows, you can go to my.nd.edu slash online learning. I'm Kevin Brennan with the Notre Dame Alumni Association. Thanks so much for watching.